Morgan chair. Morgan chair. Morgan. It's a little bit strange to look at it this way, but I guess we'll survive. <laughs> uh, clerk will take the roll. Uh, Commissioner Kern. Yes. Commissioner Doherty. Here. Commissioner Floyd. Here. Commissioner Japan Porter. Here. Commissioner Melitas. Here. Commissioner Rodolph. Here. Chair Rosenbaum. Here. Uh, the approval of the December 15th, 2022 commission meeting minutes. I'm sure everybody has read them. Uh, do I have a motion? Here. I move to approve the December 15th, 2020 commission meetings as written. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Doherty? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Dupont Porter? Yes. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. We have now the warehouse update. Chris? Good morning, Good morning Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Chris Mayton. I'm the Distilled Spirits Program Director for the OLCC. I'm here today to give you an update on the warehouse and headquarter project. Um, briefly, Good news, the best news I can give you is we have uh, the CMGC that I've been looking to promote the RFP for, which is the general contractor construction manager, which is going to be the person that oversees the, the building. Uh, the RFP was released on January 4th, so that's out in, in market right now. Um, we should close on that uh, hopefully sometime in uh, late April um, and get the CMGC hired, and then we can actually start on the, uh, the feasibility of the construction design. Uh, next stage of, of the project and then begin construction hopefully in what we'll I'll call it the early part of, of next year so about 12 to 14 months away on the other side of that last week we had a, um, a meeting with legislators about 10 or 12 of them um, and a bunch of industry stakeholders uh, down by our property at, at Columbia uh, which is right next door to the, the Canby uh, Baker Center property it was really good um, you know, there's a lot of questions uh, they were going around about that property itself and the purchase feasibility of it. And, you know, I just want to put on the record, we had a great relationship with DAF Real Estate and the work that they did, um, doing their due diligence to help us find the, the right need for our transportation needs and density that we had um, a, a lot of, you know, they're in a very limited market space. Um, if you remember back to like 2019, I think there were only 11 viable properties that even existed. And of those 11, only four met the requirements we needed. Um, and then that those four with the low vacancy rate quickly sold two of them. So it was really down to two properties and Baker Center was always our first choice. And I just want to put on the record, thank you to Dash Real Estate for all the hard work that they did to help us get that 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 property when, when we needed it so that we can continue to keep the predictable and stable revenue uh, for Oregonians in place. So with that, um, that's really my update, short and sweet. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Questions? Great work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you, Chris. That was short and sweet. Uh, we have the Associated Liquor Stores of Oregon. Salim, I know you're there. I don't believe Oliver or Tracy are with us today, but Cameron is on the call. And I think I got that right. Good morning, Salim. Good morning, Chair Rosenbaum. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like it's pretty sunny where you are. Um, uh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioners, uh, good morning. My name is Salim Narani, uh, president of Associated Liquor Stores of Oregon and uh, operating liquor stores in Albany, Corvallis, and Springfield. The Oregon liquor stores represent the best of a hybrid system of retail distilled spirits in Oregon. Oregon Liquor Control Commission contracts with agents who are residents of Oregon to operate the 284 plus stores in Oregon. Because of the fact, that the state owns the inventory in liquor stores, we as store owners are able to offer a large and diverse selection of distilled spirits. Such a selection, one would be hard pressed to find in other states unless one visits a specialty store like Bevmore or Total Wines. Most supermarkets in the so-called open states like California, Arizona, and yes, even Washington, tend to carry only the fastest moving items of no more than 250 products. Our retail selection of distilled spirits is further enhanced by the craft distilleries based right here in Oregon. Over the last few years, Oregon has emerged as a premier producer of craft distilled spirits in the United States. 
Oregon produced products account for a substantial portion of total liquor sales annually. The revenue produced by the liquor stores and the local distillers stay right here in the, our community, benefiting the state, counties, and our cities. Currently, the OCC stocks more than 3,100 products, including more than 800 made by Oregon distillers. There are over 2,200 specialty and hard to find items, which can be ordered by the liquor stores. These special order items can be requested by any store. Another major advantage we see as retailers is that we can order most of the items in small quantities. This allows us to merchandise to select clientele who may want to buy only one or two bottles a month. The warehouse's generous policies help out Oregon distillers by making it easy for us to order in smaller quantities. Sales gains in Oregon have now been 6% or higher for <coughs> the last few consecutive years. And we have been able to retain the gains from the pandemic. If Oregon maintains the growth pace, sales are on track to eclipse the $1 billion milestone in 2025. However, the current warehouse is running at full capacity. We are now in the danger of losing sales because of capacity issues. The new planned warehouse will project demand capacity 10 to 15 years down the road. Is the right choice and the right decision. This move will not only protect the current system of retailing, but enhance it with efficient warehouse to store deliveries. The additional revenue generated for the state more than justifies the investment. The liquor retail system still needs improvement. As customer needs and demands change, retailers must be in a position to address those needs. And the warehouse upgrades are part of the overall improvements. Some of the changes require internal approval and some legislative, and we hope to see many positive changes enacted in the future. As brokers push for liquor on their shelves, we must ask the question why? Is there a need? Are we not meeting the consumer demand? What is the motivation behind this push? It certainly can be altruistic concern for the consumers. Grocers cite convenience as the need for privatization. Well, let me be completely clear. It is about money. Oregon, like I mentioned, is on track to surpass $1 billion in sales by 2025, and the grocers want a piece of it. Under the current system, <clears throat> small mom and pop business owners operate the 284 plus liquor stores in Oregon. All the revenue generated stays right here in Oregon. If the system were to change like it did in Washington, not only will the profit flow right out of Oregon, but the consumers will see a huge price increase as evidenced by the shelf prices in Washington. I certainly understand the convenience argument of being able to purchase your liquor along with your groceries. There are some grocers with liquors, liquor already on their shelves. I suggest the next store expansion be limited to grocers only. Give them the exclusive opportunity to apply for score expansion. We will see how many grocers step up to the challenge and take advantage of the opportunity to provide the so-called convenience for the Oregonians. They are so concerned about it that they spent over a million dollars on the last ballot measure effort in 2022. Under our current system, the state of Oregon has the exclusive right to store, distribute, price, and sell packaged distilled spirits to state licensed retail stores. This regulated system ensures stable pricing for customers, gives smaller local Oregon based distillers the ability to sell their products to consumers statewide, and ensures that the sales are regulated to keep liquor out of the hands of miners. Revenue from the OLCC funds essential services at the city, county, and state levels, including schools, public health programs, and public safety. I would suggest also suggest a legislative solution of capping the off-premise outlets licenses similar to open states based on population. 
switching gears. In our last presentation, uh, we had expressed concerns over the rate of shoplifting, burglaries, and break-ins. Mm -hmm. I understand there are legislative proposals for the upcoming session. It breaks my heart to announce that one of the new expansion stores, due to the high number of break-ins, the landlord is not renewing the lease. Um, if you allow me a couple of minutes, I have a statement from him that I would like to uh, read for you. And this is this is the PDF store at uh, by the airport. Um, shoplifting was something that took place all, almost on a daily basis. And we had the highest claims and police reports in the state. I'm told that we were very vigilant about keeping up on those we could actually identify, although I'm certain we missed a lot. We had a string of four overnight break-ins in addition to all the hostility and threats the staff constantly faced. To ensure the safety of the staff, I was forced to hire armed security five days a week at a cost of over $50,000 a year. Mall security and management were well aware of the challenges we faced. We did not have an option on lease as the center avoids providing those they call so they can eliminate businesses they felt were not a good fit. When it come time to re renew our lease, upper management said they were not interested in having a liquor store in our space. And we have been forced to shut down and close our doors. So their last day of operation is going to be end of the month. This was this was PDX liquor over by the airport? Yes. Wow. Oh. Okay. So his final paragraph or comment is that after over $750,000 of investment, considerable time and effort in building a beautiful space and business, and finally getting to a point where we have sufficient sales to start recouping our time, energy, and investment, we are essentially out of business and have nothing to show for it. <clears throat> this is very sad. It's a sad set of affairs, and I think um given the number of shoplifting and burglaries and all that that um uh, we you know as a commission really need to put um, some serious uh, emphasis on on this on this problem i understand that there was a three person um uh group or committee that uh, and you know we haven't gotten much of an update and i understand also that the lead person is uh, no longer part of that group. So I would suggest that the commission um, look at that and follow up on what we can do, what can we do to, to help to help the agents. Um, I think also that the commission should consider some kind of a reimbursement for, for the agent. It is no, it's through no fault of his own that he's being driven out of business literally. Um, when we last presented question, to, Salim, when, yes. when the PDX um, by the airport, how long has he been? That was the second expansion, do you know? Was it the first? How long has first. he been in business? First. It was the first, first. expansion. So five, first. five year. So only five years. years. So generally you get a five year lease. Um, that was a high volume store, wasn't it? I mean, right over the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Huh. Wow, five years. Yes. And probably, what did you say about a $750,000? $750,000 investment. It's just getting strike, yeah. hitting the strike, you know, start recouping some of that money, and now there it comes. That's sad. Um, when we last presented to the commission, I also touched on uh, market based cash value for our liquor stores. A market based value encourages existing both large and small store owners to make the investment in upgrading their store, providing an enhanced and convenient one-stop shopping experience. Here is why this policy change is positive move. Previously, existing liquor store owners had no incentive to remodel, upgrade, or invest if they could only look forward to a goodwill just on the liquor sales. Now they will invest with the assurance of a market value for their entire business and not just the liquor component. Uh, the retail services is working on formalizing the process. Um, in October 2022, commission meeting, uh, you appointed a new agent for the Salem Battle Creek store, 
uh, which used the market-based cash value as the buyout. There were four highly qualified applicants uh, who made presentation to you. Uh, not a single one of them had any hesitation in paying the market-based goodwill for the business. The ROI on the store was under four years. It's a great investment opportunity, and one can find a business investment with such great returns while serving the residents of Oregon. I have my Springfield store coming up for reappointment, and the applicants will be presenting to you in the March meeting. The ROI on the Springfield store is three and a half years. A substantial portion of the profit margin is generated by non-liquor <coughs> add-on items to the liquor purchases. This store provides a truly one-stop shopping experience for consumers. We as an association also have been advocating to the liquor store owners to expand their space, upgrade stock beer and wine in addition to distilled spirits for an enhanced consumer experience and an untapped revenue stream. I have joining with me um, remotely Cameron Scott of Griffith, Trayer and Evans, a business valuation and CPA company. Uh, they provided both the Battle Creek store and my Springfield store uh, with a market-based value report. Uh, Cameron can provide you with a quick summary on how the values are derived, uh, as well as any questions that uh, the commission may have. Cameron. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Salim. Uh, like Salim mentioned, uh, I work for a CPA and business valuation company based out of Spokane, Washington. Um, our firm is designed to provide business valuations for small to medium sized businesses, typically under uh, 10 to 20 million dollars in sales. Um, our valuation uh, is focused on providing an effective solution for business owners to achieve a valuation for various processes, uh, specifically for what Salim's talking about here is for business sales or for financial planning. Um, a little bit about our valuations. Um, we are uh, part of the National Association of Certified Valuators, uh, NACVA, based out of Utah. Um, they are one of the primary valuation associations in the United States. Um, all of our valuations are uh, in accordance with the AICPA, which is the CPA Board of Governance, and then also um, the Uniform Standards Professional Appraisal Practices, which is uh, what the Small Business Administration follows for their valuation processes as well. Um, in our valuations, we do three different. Uh, one of them is a market approach where we look at similar businesses, uh, for example, similar liquor stores in similar revenue ranges, and we use multiples that we can derive off of various uh, databases. Another approach that we use is an income approach, which is based on uh, the specific company at hand's cash flows. And the last one is an is a, uh, asset approach, which is essentially a, a liquidation value. Worst case, we had to shut down the business tomorrow. What kind of value could you derive from your business? Um, in most cases, um, we almost rely on, we almost always rely on the income approach. It's a value specific to the business at hand. It's based on their tax returns, typically at least three years worth of financial history. Um, and what we do is we, we pull together at least three years worth of tax returns. Um, we make various adjustments to get it to a fair market value basis. And what example of that is, is if owners are overpaying themselves or underpaying themselves, we have to think of ourselves as investors coming into a business and we're not going to overpay an employee just because we want to or we're not going to underpay them. We have to pay fair market value rates uh, for and another example is rent expense. Sometimes maybe not as familiar with you guys in your industry, but uh, many times business owners own their own real estate and, and they can charge themselves whatever rent they want. Uh, so we need to adjust that to what a fair market value rent expense would be. Um, another area is we eliminate discretionary expenses, any kind of non reoccurring expenses, such as what we've recently been seeing is PPP loans or other grants that don't reflect uh, operational income. So we're trying to derive a true normalized operational income, look at historical earnings and use that historical earnings to project a future earnings. Um, so one piece of that is the income cash flow stream. Another part is the rate of return, kind of what uh, Salim was talking about, a return on investment of three, three and a half, four years. We see most small businesses sell anywhere from two to five times their cash flow stream depending on the size and the industry and the risk factors is specifically associated with that business. Um, one thing to note about our valuations and what we do is um, 
we produce valuations that we think can be loanable. Um, and what I mean there is we do a lot of valuations for small business or SBA banks. And they come to us because in the SBA process, when uh, borrowers are looking at an SBA loan and specifically a 7A loan, the SBA requires they go get their own independent appraisal of their business as a final check mark for the bank. Um, similar to a real estate appraisal if you're going to go sell real estate. And the banks look at uh, business values based on cash flows. They want to ensure that, hey, if this business is going to do this cash flow, can they afford this debt service payment? And we have a similar process. We make sure that our valuations uh, can be paid back in the loan. And typically that's, you know, right now it's a little more challenging with interest rates, but uh, that's really the, the core value here is to make sure that our valuations uh, can be afforded by a business owner coming in and buying that business. Um, it's also want to make sure that we're getting the highest value for our, for our seller because we want to maximize that value as well. Um, so that's kind of the standard, the process of our valuation. Um, we've really done our best to to make this as effective and simple as for business owners. I hope uh, Celine can attest to that. Um, does anybody have any questions in regards to our valuation process? Yeah, I, I, one very quick one. Uh, has the IRS, have you had conversations with the IRS about you know, your evaluation methods and so forth? I assume you have. Yeah, great question. So the IRS has a standard evaluation that they like to see, and specifically for estate planning, gift tax, or for various areas where tax comes into play. They go under the fair market value standard of value. That is the same standard of value that we rely on as well. What that essentially means, and I could read you the, def the exact definition, but I'll save you the time, essentially means it's, it's an arm's length transaction. A hypothetical buyer knowing all the facts, a hypothetical seller knowing all the facts come together on fair grounds and make a deal. Um, so we utilize the same standard of value that the IRS likes to see uh, just because we do all of our valuations, whether it's for estate planning, gift tax planning, business sales, business purchases. We use the same across the board to make it effective for our clients. Thank you. Jared Rosenbaum. Commissioner. Tony, a couple things. Uh, one, I'm on that group about the crime and it has not been put on the back burner. So we're, we'll be getting information uh, as to what we've been doing and what we'd like to have happen uh, very soon to you. Okay, I, 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 so I, that's, you know, thank you. I, I appreciate that because I hear a lot from from uh, store owners, you know, and they have seen the presentation that we have made to you and expressed our concerns. And um, there has been not much in terms of communication back to to the agents. So. You know, we would appreciate then some kind of feedback too, so that yes, you know, we have not forgotten about you. We're working on it, and so I appreciate that. In addition to that, is in, as it relates to um, new warehouse. Uh, first off, I want to thank Rosie for putting together that representatives and senators that showed up because they need to know what you know and what other uh, licensees know. Is that in order for us to continue what we're doing? In the future, we have to have additional space. Uh, we have long been over have over capacity in what we're trying to do. So, uh, Rosie, I see a, fix, a picture of you someplace here. Uh, I want to say thank you because it's important that the legislators know that what our licensees need to have is, and what the consumers need, is the ability to do our job. And we can't do our job if we don't have space to do it in. On the other side of it is, as it relates to the expansion, um, I like your idea about, you know, if the stores, grocery stores want to have liquor. Uh, and one of our first expansion scenarios, we allowed the national change to participate in that process. And when it was all said and done, they backed out of the deal. So it, this is about money. This is about they don't want control. And when I said national carriers, I do mean international as well. They didn't want to follow our rules. They didn't want to pay, have funds go through, how we wanted to have funds to go through. So I'm more than happy to say, hey, national chain, you want to have liquor uh, on your shelf, please apply. Here are the rules and regulations. And all you have to do is, is play by the rules. We're more than happy to help you. They don't want to do that, or they haven't been wanting to do that in the past. 
So expansion, I like the idea. Um, we we want to listen as long as it's responsible selling of the products that we have. Um, and I think we're going to have continued discussions around uh, market-based sales of what happened. What happens with the liquor business is not just the bottles on the shelves. We understand that. So we're going to keep working with you. And we're going to keep looking at the different opportunities out there. And we do need the legislature to understand why we're doing what we're doing from a business perspective. Uh, it's, it's important because we continue to try to be a, uh, ahead of the game and not behind. So thank you very much and your team. We'll be back to discuss you. things with you. I yeah, appreciate it. appreciate the comments. Any great other job. questions? Oh, uh, great job. Keep up the great work. I, yeah, I think it's it's great that you're willing to to work with the grocers and down on the map conversations because we all, I think, I mean, what I thought it was encouraging is there is some grocers that have taken us up on the store, the store model, mostly the local ones. So I, I think it's good that we're all, you know, that, that we're, we're trying to preserve a system that works really well for the state and that we're all on the same page because we're all we're on the same team. So that's, that's good, Jerk. Extending all branch there. Uh, thank, thank you, Salim. Thank you. And I live in Sisters, Oregon, and we raise grocery stores, got a liquor store inside there. So they, it does work, and we're willing to work with them to I, I make that happen. Salim, I have yeah. one question before you go. Yes, Chairman. What is the percentage of liquor store owners who are not in your organization? I'm, 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 it's uh, embarrassing to say uh, that even though we advocate so much for all the all the store owners in Oregon, uh, whether they are members or not, um, but we have about a 50% uh, participation rate. So 50% uh, of the liquor store owners in Oregon are not part of your organization? Um, I would, I would, I would uh, suggest I look at it as, as uh, my glass is half full. So, so, <clears throat> so when you come in front of us and you talk about all of these critical issues that's that's affecting every single store owner and their livelihood, their pensions, and everything else, you're telling us sitting here today, this is not any criticism of you, obviously. You do a fantastic job, but 50% of the liquor store owners in this state don't even participate? Uh, Chair, Chairman, I'm sad to say this. Yes, you are, you are correct in your observation. Um, Dan Miner just, just pointed out to me to make sure um, that you understand that the members, the, the stores who are members of our association, uh, they produce 70% of the revenue as well. Mm -hmm. So we have some smaller stores and we have made it very, you know, we have even floated the idea for them that, you know, hey, if you want to take advantage of a one-year free membership. Um, so we have had very few people actually even well, uh, take advantage of that. You obviously understand why I'm bringing this subject up. I can't understand in any way, shape or form any liquor store owner in this state who doesn't have an interest, um, their livelihood, their business, it's almost insane for them not to be part of your organization. It makes no sense at all. Thank you. I appreciate your time and effort. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next is the vote on extension of the 50%, <clears throat> 50 cent surcharge on the still spirits product. Um, I just one quick comment on this. This is never a quick comment. Uh, this is an ongoing issue. Uh, while we're taking a vote on it today, we've had extensive input from the public. We have extensive conversations, and um, we are completely aware of what this issue is. There's been a lot of communication and discussion on it. And Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is the uh, only the continuation of the temporary 50 cent surcharge that you know, has been around for a decade. Um, commission acts on this. Uh, usually we act in September this year. We're acting on it in January up for your consideration. 
It's been properly noticed. We've had it out for public comment for the required days and it's in front of you for final action. I'll just remind you, this is the charge on bottles uh, that goes directly to the general fund of the legislature. Uh, this uh, biennium is projected to be about $45 million um, to help uh, round out uh, the budget. So with that, Chair Can you hear me? Commissioner? Yes. Chair Mayor Levon? Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Steve. I think one of the things that um, this commission um, needs is to have, whatever we do at this point, there needs to be further discussions. Um, we have a number of new commissioners uh, that, were, that are here uh, since uh, uh, this surcharge was implemented that it might be a good idea in the future to have a, a greater understanding as to how it was originally implemented and how we see it um, working uh, in the future, as well as how the industry um, sees our participation. Uh, we know that uh, these funds are always in great need uh, to the overall budget situation what we're trying to do. And there are a lot of things that we are trying to work on from a business perspective, but it's, at times it may, it's a good idea to go back and look and see where we were so we can get an idea as to where we need to go. So if, if staff could take a look at that in the future, that would be kind of a, a good thing for us to uh, get a handle on. That'd be fine. I, uh, the, 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 any of the commissioners have any other comments? Chair. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, I do. I mean, I just want to make a comment that I think it would be um, beneficial in the future for the commission to have more conversation about this and more educational uh, discussions, either with the governor's office or um, on, on how this works. Because we understand as a commission that this was intended to be something that would sunset um, and that it has not sunsetted, and it was intended to be a stopgap for a budget shortfall, which seems at this point like it's just being counted on in the governor's budget. So I understand at this point that it is already budgeted in, and it, it is something that is necessary at this point, but I do want to see a um, an effort that we do what we said we were going to do, which was going to sunset. And so in the future, we would like to see, I would like to see us uh, make an effort to actually do what we said we were going to do, which was to sunset this provision. Um, and, you know, do in the future, this is not only a continuation of a 50 cent surcharge. This 50 cent surcharge impacts are the Oregonians and the constituents that we serve. And so I think it's really important that um, while at this point I am going to be voting yes at this point, um, that, and I'm, I'm recalling and kind of drawing this out, but I recall when I went to uh, my interview session and, and the, uh, the meeting to confirm, and one of the questions I asked was, what are your viewpoints on things? And I remember my what I said, which was, I don't have a dog in the fight. I'm here to learn. I'm here to make good decisions. And so I feel like that's what I try to tackle every problem with and everything that we're presented with is with an open mind in doing what is best. And there are some certainly some things with this with this 50 cent surcharge that I think in the future we need to consider. Um, and uh, with an open mind that it's not just an automatic thing. Um, so that's all I would, would say. Well, <clears throat> I, I appreciate all the comments made by the commissioners. I, I, this, is, this is all my responsibility. I, I, and let me tell you why. Um, ever since I've been chairman, each one of you commissioners know that my Verbigal door is always open for discussion. I'm always available. I I hide nothing, and 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 you 
each one of you, I would just assume because we have such a good working relationship that if there was a, an issue with this, you just call me and talk to me about it. Um, it's my responsibility and I received no calls. I had no uh, indication that there was any concern. And I, I hear you loud and clear and maybe I better do a better job of contacting each one of you as opposed to having my door open. I, uh, you know, there's no um, criticism here. It's just an observation that uh, I may need to do a better job on these things to just to stay in touch with you on it. And, and for that, I apologize. Uh, um, uh, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves in is we have an open discussion and open communication. I love that. Chair yeah, Rosenbaum. Yes, Commissioner. I move to extend the temporary surcharge through 2023 through 2025 biennium. Do I? Have, I we don't we don't need a second on it. Uh, please take the roll. Commissioner Curran. Yes. Commissioner Doherty? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Japong Porter? Yes. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Aval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. And thank you, Commissioners. Um, compliance, uh, let's take them separately. The alcohol stipulated settlement agreements. Does anybody have, uh, well, uh, let's not take your job away from, I always do this. Uh, Victoria, come on up. <laughs> morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, my name is Victoria Brown. I'm a case presenter with the Administrative Hearings Division. We have four alcohol settlements and one marijuana settlement for your consideration today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Commissioners? Uh, Chair Rosenbaum, Commissioner. Commissioner? Boyd. I've got just a quick question on the uh, all-in-one market. Was this person buying alcohol? Was were they in fact uh, a minor, or were they just presumably under twenty-six years old? Uh, Commissioner Floyd, this was a minor decoy operation, and so they actually were a minor. Uh, they were. They had their true ID with them available for inspection. So they were a minor. Yes. Isn't that usually a cat one? This is a cat. A cat two. Uh, Commissioner Floyd, this is a CAT 2B, um, and so it is a um, presumed 10-day or $2,500 civil penalty. Aren't they generally yeah. CAT 1s um, serving in minors? No, I don't believe so. Okay. And, they, and are you thinking the distinction between minor and juvenile? Minor being under 21? Yeah, minor being under, yeah. So these are, I believe, these have always been, or they used to be Category 3s, and now they're Category 2Bs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was that was my question. Sure. If there's no other questions, I need a motion. Chair. Commissioner. I move to ratify the. Are we taking these? Sorry, uh, individually or? No, we we'll take all four of them because there's no problem with them. Okay. I think the alcohol is okay. Okay, I, I move to ratify the four stipulated settlement agreements as proposed by staff. Commissioner Kern? Yes. Commissioner Doherty? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Mm -hmm. Yes. Commissioner Japan Porter? Yes. Commissioner Miletus? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. Okay, the marijuana stipulated settlement agreement, EEK, any discussion? No discussion. I know the operator, good operator, sounds like it was a uh, stake and they've rectified it. Uh, correct, Chris, uh, Commissioner Molinas. This There was um, three violations here at issue. Um, there was no indication that there was um, diversion in any of them, and they were very responsive to commission the uh, commission's request to pull products. I. Is there any further discussion? I just want to tell you that I had a conversation with staff and Steve yesterday on this one, and I think we've reached the conclusion that when you have a case like this, a little bit more information is really necessary. I couldn't tell uh, from the factual situation exactly what was transpiring. I thought it was much worse 
than it really was. And the 50 pounds was a significant amount until it was explained to me. So I didn't want to waste the commission's time on this. So I asked for staff to uh, to brief me on it. And I think in the future it would do us all well if if on cases like this, the staff will give us a little bit more detail. Thank you, Chair Rosenbaum. Okay, I need a motion. Chair. Commissioner. I move to ratify the stipulated settlement agreement for uh, EEK as proposed by staff. Commissioner Kern. Yes. Commissioner Doherty. Yes. Commissioner Floyd. Yes. Commissioner Japon Porter. Yes. Commissioner Miletus. Yes. Commissioner Aval. Yes. Chair Rosenbaum. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're on rules now. Nicole, advertising on retail liquor stores. Yes, good morning, Chair Rosenbaum and commissioners. For the record, my name is Nicole Blasse, and I'm the rules coordinator for the OLCC. I'm here to present one rulemaking action for your consideration today. This is initial action for advertising in a retail liquor store. <clears throat> House Bill 2264 passed in the 2021 legislative session. This bill was codified as ORS 471.750. It deleted language that prohibited signs or displays within a store to be visible from the outside of the store and added requires the OPC to approve. <laughs> Just one second. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> it requires the OLCC to adopt rules governing advertising in such stores. In response to this legislation, Commission staff proposes to initiate rulemaking to update OAR 845-015-0177 to reflect the legislative changes. And staff or I would be happy to answer any questions. Chair sure, Rosenbaum. Chair, I'm sorry I unmuted you. Can you unmute yourself? Commissioner, go ahead. In going through this, I was kind of surprised. This kind of reminded me of the days when you walked into a liquor store and you gave them a note and they went back and got you a bottle and <laughs> took cash only. <clears throat> uh, it's like, you know, let's not let everybody know we're actually selling liquor in this spot here. You can't have, I don't want to see the captain from outside the, on his foot on the money from outside the store. It's kind of, kind of a goofy had to happen at this late day. Yes, Chair, uh, Commissioner Raval, we, um, this is in response to legislation. If you would like additional information, I do have our staff member, Brian Fleming, here that can expand a little bit more. <laughs> I was hoping I wouldn't fall. <laughs> um, we love being Mr. Fleming. <laughs> you know, there was a, there was a, I grew up in the, you get out. <laughs> so, like, there was a, I grew up in the Midwest, and, and when Kansas changed the law, to have liquor, people were quite upset because you know you had to go to the store, give them the note, they didn't take checks, just cash only. And the big complaint was the bootleggers came down from Kansas City, brought you the liquor, stacked it up in the garage, and took a check. <laughs> so here we are, you're gonna have advertising now. Wow. Chair Rosenbaum. <laughs> <laughs> Don't date yourself Don't like commissioners. I know. <laughs> Commissioner oh. Ravel, you've been around a long time. Chair yeah. <laughs> Rosenbaum, commissioners, for the record, Brian Fleming, director of retail services. You're absolutely correct in your description. Uh, this is a, a remnant of the way we went to retail and liquor stores. Obviously, today, this we've worked, uh, Steve, oh, there's Steve's on the screen, but Steve's known about this for four plus years, six years. We've tried to change. 471, 750 is what guides our system. And so sometimes cracking open pieces of that. This was merely legislative change that says, we're okay with you seeing into our liquor stores, which has been apparent for many, many years. We're okay that a sign says something from outside that's 
light and bright and attractive to the store. This is modern retail, much like a, uh, uh, what an Ulta, Nordstrom, come on in, we're open for business. Uh, and this is merely a housekeeping. And I discovered this, uh, it was in December, I think, uh, Nicole worked uh, very swiftly to get this in front of you because um, we we really didn't enforce what you could see, you know, 12 feet back from the wall, but that's essentially said, you can't see that sign is 12 feet inside the store. So she moved this pretty quickly, very thankful, gets us up to date. Our advertising rules are now up to date. Uh, as you know, a lot of it's speech, so it's very well protected, but this is mm -hmm. something she moves very swift, swiftly that aligns with the statute and the rule defines what they can. We strip out the sentences, but your depiction, I, I need to probably have an off, uh, <laughs> off-site meeting with you about all your things you experienced in the, uh, years ago, but this is this is a good thing for liquor stores. Uh, and it is a bit of a relic uh, from years gone by. Um, I don't think it dates to prohibition, but it's definitely something that since we semi-privatized the system to have independent operators. Happy to answer any other questions. And thanks to Renee and Steve, uh, I think are the ones that really pushed this last session. They knew it was here uh, and they got them. So very thankful that it's, uh, we can now have a sign that says, welcome, <laughs> come on in. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> any Chair. further discussion? Chair. Commissioner? I move to initiate rulemaking to amend OAR 845-015-0177 and to hold a rulemaking hearing at staff's discretion. Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Commissioner Doherty? Yes. Commissioner Floyd? Yes. Commissioner Japan Porter? Yes. Commissioner Melitas? Yes. Commissioner Raval? Yes. Chair Rosenbaum? Yes. And thank you both. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, <laughs> Steve, any final comments or any comments? And um, no, I appreciate uh, the discussion on the surcharge. And uh, I will remind you, and the legislature well knows with that surcharge and our markup, we are right there next to Washington, amongst the highest in the country in markup and prices. And that is, you know, a competitive uh, issue for us, and it also affects revenue. So certainly raising this uh, going forward is very important. We had those comments, particularly from the industry, uh, in the record. And uh, I will make sure to carry that forward with both the legislature and the governor's office. I will note there is some legislation uh, being introduced that would consider making that a legislative action. It would redirect some of it to the Distillers Guild. That's obviously a concept they're working with with the legislature. And uh, we'll uh, make sure you're fully informed about that and how to guide, you know, support or guide their desire to get um, uh, a distribution from the surcharge, perhaps without uh, a legislative action. Um, and because of your intentness on uh, looking again at the temporary nature of that surcharge. So I appreciate that discussion. Um, you know, if you notice, I think some of you saw us, our press release, we had some tainted product with hemp inside our system that got out to the wild with uh, in the general market as a hemp product, probably had too much TAC. There was a little confusion about exactly what the products were. There weren't good records. Uh, we initiated the recall inside our system, but outside our system, you know, in the general markets, you know, it's not entirely clear to us, you know, who has full authority, the company uh, Firefly, um, work cooperatively with that. Um, so we made sure customers in the open market and retailers were apprised of the recall of those products uh, that are out there. There wasn't, uh, at least I, I uh, recall that we didn't have, um, you know, they weren't everywhere across the state. It was probably in the, uh, I might have my numbers wrong here, so I'm not going to put it out there. Um, but I think it was a contained quantity and we're looking to specific places and we thought that it was potentially already consumed because it had been out there sold and consumed for a while. Um, we are not aware of any health effects related to that product. 
We, uh, uh, to date, or to my knowledge to date, we have not received a complaint about that topic. Um, but wanted to just uh, say that there is this point of confusion and authority underlap, probably not overlap, on in the general market with these products that are cannabis related. Um, how we provide oversight. Of course, that could be solved with more FDA oversight of this uh, hemp derived products in the marketplace and uh, uh, clear testing standards. Uh, but for the time being, we did everything we could um, to protect consumers in Oregon. Chair Rosenbaum. Commissioner. Steve, you know, the, the old insurance guy in me still has questions about. Do we have any liability as, as it relates to uh, product liability with all the products that are being produced that are in our, any of our stores or licensees? You know, I'll get the real legal answer for that, but no, <laughs> uh, not generally for us. Okay. Our, our, our licensees may have, right? Um, they're not protected by, you know, like alcohol over all those years has got product liability protections we haven't built that has not been built up around the cannabis industry um dram shop type laws that are in other states and otherwise so um that's still uh, in the evolution in this and you remember there weren't insurance products even available because it was federally illegal so that 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 policy area uh has not really developed in oregon or across the country significantly a few states have addressed, and I can get you more information on that, Marvin. Thank you. Paul. <laughs> Any other questions, commissioners? Well, it's 9.59. I think we set a record today. <laughs> With nothing else, I move to adjourn. Marvin, and Mr. Chair, I just do want to note, I will be, right, we're testifying in front of uh, Chairman Bynum's committee, House Economic Development today. They want a background on uh, OLCC systems, a number of uh, industry folks, public safety groups. I think they'll have uh, prevention and drug treatment uh, groups next week. We'll follow on that. Uh, but we really do appreciate the opportunity to get an early start uh, educating the committee on what OLCC does and what some of our priorities are coming up in this session, particularly, you know, those ones that are ours are really getting a handle on home delivery in a systemic and accountable way for deliveries to happen at the door of alcoholic products. And on the marijuana side, the task force has a number of bills. We really have more people carrying our marijuana related policy legislation than us. For us, though, uh, one of the primary, a couple of the primary pieces are really getting that reference lab in place with the Oregon Department of Agriculture so we can test final products and a program for us to have uh, more authority in working to get lab compliance and oversight in place. Um, so we'll be talking to them about those priorities and uh, appreciate the commission meeting. Thank you very much, Commissioner. One one final thing, both you and uh, Rosie, please keep in mind all the commissioners had indicated at the last meeting that uh, they were willing and able to help in the legislative process. And I hope that you uh, utilize all of us over the coming months. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.